Let us pray. Dear God, please help me to preach. May the words that I say be more than just my words. If I have anything worth saying, please open their ears to hear me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. There was once a, a young man who went to visit a rabbi. And he walked into the rabbi's house and he realized the rabbi didn't really have any furniture. He almost had no stuff. And he looked at the rabbi and said, Rabbi, where, where's all your furniture? Where's all your stuff? And the rabbi looked at him and said, well, where's all your furniture? And the young man was confused and he said, Rabbi, I'm just here to visit. And the rabbi said, so am I. <laughs> so am I. Today's sermon is called, How to Survive the End of the World. Now, the end of the world is a fascinating topic. It is used constantly in Hollywood movies, TV shows. We, we like to talk about the end of the world. There's three or four major plots. We kind of talked about it earlier today. Um, three or four major plots that we use to end the world. <laughs> you know, the, the, there's really popular ones like the nuclear holocaust. We like that one. You know, bombs go off and then we blow ourselves up. Another really popular one is like alien invasions. You've seen these movies, right? Aliens come in, they try to take over. Um, let's see, what other ones? Natural disaster, disease, robots, zombies, computers, genetic mutations, you name it. We thought of a way to end the world with it, and we made a great movie about it. And this is so common in our, this is such a common theme. It's led to really kind of a strange trend in our world. Um, there, there, there are groups of people out there, affectionately known as preppers. Does anybody know what this is? Preppers? You heard about that? Yeah, some of you know. Um, these people are people that believe that the end of the world is going to, you know, it's coming and that they, they are actively preparing to survive the end of the world, whether it be robots or zombies or whatever, they're getting ready. And it's amazing. The internet is just full of, of videos and websites, discussion forums, tutorials on how to, how to get ready for the end of the world, how to build a proper bomb shelter, what kind of weapons to do, what kind of food storage to have. It's amazing the time, the money, the preparation that these people will go through to survive the end of the world. They truly believe that only those who are prepared will survive the end of the world. Only those who are ready will be able to handle what's coming. And you know they're not wrong. Only those who are ready will be able to handle what's coming. But of course, we don't have to worry about zombies or robots. What we should be worried about as Christians, we have our own version of preparing for the end of the world. Today is the fourth in a series of sermons on um, the parables of Jesus. Today we're talking about how to live this life today, planning for tomorrow. And so we're going to dive right into our text for today. And there's a man who comes to Jesus with a question of inheritance and money. And Jesus responds in verse 15 and he says, Beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. Life is not measured by how much you own. And to push the point a little bit farther, he tells this story about a rich farmer. A rich farmer has got a great farm, and then one year the crop is so huge that he, he can't store all the stuff. And so he's, you know, he's got some nice barns, but he decides to tear down the barns, build even bigger barns to keep everything for himself. In order to keep everything, he builds nicer barns. And then we get to God's response in verse 20. And God says to him, you fool, you will die this very night. Then who will get everything you worked for? Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth and not have a rich relationship with God. You will die this very night. All his crops, all the stuff he tried to keep for himself, at the end of the day, it's useless. You can't take it with you. And I think the key to the story is verse 15. Life is not measured by how much you own. Life is not measured by how much you own. Now, we know this. We've heard this before, right? Life is not who dies with the most toys. It's a pretty common theme. But over the years, it's been replaced by another theme. It's kind of clever. Have any of you ever heard this? Life is not the number of breaths you take, but the moments that take your breath away. Has anybody heard that before? You see like those inspirational photos of like a sunrise or a sunset or something, and it's got, life is not the number of breaths you take, but the moments that take your breath away. And it's kind of clever. It's kind of a fun little phrase. It's pretty clever. Um, and most companies have actually adapted. They've figured out how to sell you 
moments that take your breath away. If you look at most companies nowadays in their commercials, they're selling you an experience. They don't really focus on the product. They don't, you know, they don't talk about what it is they're actually selling. They talk about the experience, right? Cedar Point's um, new slogan is, uh, what is it? A, roller a new roller coaster experience. Universal Studios has a new Jurassic World ride, and you know you get a two for one sale. I just found out. Um, <laughs> and it's it's uh, what is it? Dare to ride. That's Universal. Dare to ride. It's not about the roller coaster. It's about the experience. And then of course there's Disney World. Their catchphrase. What is it? Come and enjoy the magic. Right? Or if you get the Blu-rays, Disney Blu-rays. It's experience the magic. The Disney Blu-ray, right? We're all about experiencing, you know? These companies have gotten very good at selling you moments. Moments have become the new toy, the new thing that we gather in the first world, the thing that we gather in our society. Life is not measured by how much you own, but life is also not measured by how many great moments you can cram into this one life. Life's not measured by that. It's a clever phrase, and it hints at something good. It really does. It hints at it. But that's not the good. You see, the moments that take our breath away, those are beautiful things, but they're, they're pointing us in the right direction, but they are not the good. For example, one of the really popular ones is, is the first time you hold a child. Right? The first, that's one of those moments. Um, and it's beautiful. I can see why people would want to chase that. I can see why companies are trying to bottle that up and sell that to you. That moment when, you know, a mother holds this thing that they created inside themselves. i, I got to imagine it's indescribable. It's amazing. And it points us to the right thing, but that is not, it's just a glimpse. It's just a glimpse, a sliver, a shade of the glory. It's just a glimpse, a shade of something even better. Moments of love and perfection and awe in our lives, these things point us to the actual goal. They point us in the right direction, but they are not the good. We don't want to put those above. You see, they point us to something we call it, we have a word for it in Christianity. Heaven. We call it heaven. Life is not measured by what you own. Life is not measured by moments. Life is measured by our connection to God on the way to heaven. Verse 21 tells us, yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth but not have a rich relationship with God. Have we forgotten heaven? In our culture, in our society, have we forgotten about heaven? Do you remember the promises that God has given us? We say that, uh, what do we say, that, that phrase, true love is a glimpse of heaven, right? Or it's a glimpse of perfection. And if true love, which is that thing that we sing about, and we have movies about, we have all this stuff, if we're so obsessed with true love and that's just a glimpse, imagine stepping into a lifetime of that experience. True love magnified a hundredfold, better than we can ever imagine. Take a second, close your eyes if it helps, take a moment. What do you think of when you think of heaven? What comes to your mind? What do you picture when you're thinking about heaven? What do you see? My, my favorite picture of heaven comes from Revelation chapter 21. 21 verse 3 and 4. And it says, look, God's home, it's, it's now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. Now, some people kind of laugh at the idea of heaven, right? You know, a city in the clouds, and everybody's got the little angel's wings and the harp and white robes for some reason. And uh, what else do we say about having the golden streets, right? And they kind of laugh at it, you know, pie in the sky, it's too good to be true. <coughs> and it's, and uh, nobody's 100% sure what heaven looks like. And so the descriptions are kind of all over the place, right? We, we don't really know. There are some things in the Bible about what heaven looks like, but nobody knows if it's symbolic or if it's literal, if that's actually what it's going to look like. But did you notice within the description I read in, verse, in Revelations 21? None of it was a physical description. No more crying, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more mourning. To be honest, I don't care what heaven looks like. There's not going to be any more pain. There's not going to be any more sorrow. I mean, maybe it's got golden streets and clouds. Maybe not. Is that what I'm worried about? The real beauty of heaven is that there is an existence where there is only love, only good things. Like, we like this world, right? We, we I like this world. We live in a beautiful planet, right? Especially in the UP. You see it a lot more. 
You guys have an amazing access to the window of God's beauty. But we have to not think about all the bad stuff. Right? We're like, oh, this world's great, except for, I mean, don't think about, like, the genocide and the horrible things that are happening out there in the world. Imagine this world perfected. Imagine this life without the bad. This is the promise that God has given us. In the end, evil loses, and evil gets washed away. The good news today is that God brings us home. God is going to create a new world here, down here, among the mortals. God brings us home. Do me a favor. Everybody, just take a deep breath. Take a deep breath. And let it go. You were able to breathe that breath because God let you. Let's do it again. Everybody breathe. We breathe because God allows us to. All the self-help, I can do it myself, I don't need anybody else, individualistic nonsense of our culture. And the truth is, you can't take a breath without God letting you do it. <clears throat> the problem with the rich man is that his plans assume that he is the master of his life. He assumes he is in control. He says, I will do this and I will do that. And God calls him a what? A fool. You're not in control. The truth is, God is the one who brings us home. This life is all about our connection to God. Everything else is commentary. The truth is, there is no confidence in tomorrow. We don't like to think about that, but there is no confidence in tomorrow. I could die on my way home today. I live 0.8 miles down the road. That's not very far. But you never know. I drive a old Jeep. You know, that thing can blow up any day. Right? I did not make it through the end of this sermon, this wonderful roof that we paid all that money that could collapse on me and kill me in an instant. I may not finish the end of this sentence. God willing, we continue. Let me say that again. God willing, we continue. We can, now there's two ways to respond to that, this realization of our own mortality, this realization that we are not in charge. Number one, we can be terrified. Always looking over our shoulder, absolutely afraid of what's coming, of when the end is coming. Or, we can be liberated. We can let go of the fear. We don't have to be afraid of when it's coming because we know who's in charge. If God takes me, then that means I was ready to go. Alright, if it happens, it happens. I don't want to, to go just yet. I've got lots to do. But if He chooses that moment, okay. If you trust, if we give that control over to God, God is the one who brings us home. Is that good news to you? Luke 21, verse 19 says, By standing firm, you win your soul. By standing firm, you win your soul. Let the knowledge that everything else in life is secondary, let that knowledge free you. We get right with God, and then we move to the rest of our life. We move into the rest of our life on the foundation of God. Change it from, I know I will do that, to God willing. God willing, I will do that. Now, there's something I want to clarify. A long time ago, there was a belief that this world was all there was. This is it. This is all we've got. And then, so if that's true, then God has to punish people in this life, right? You've probably heard things like this. You can't do bad things because you might get struck down by lightning. People used to believe this. They used to think this was everything, and so they were afraid to do bad things. So if you were successful, well, then you must be a good person. And if you were not successful, then God must hate you. You must be a bad person. There was this understanding that this world was all there is, and the question that comes out of that, the question that comes out of that is, what did I do to deserve this? Have you ever heard that? There's this belief that this life, this is it. And if that's true, then what did I do to deserve this? We don't see the whole story. God is in control, but not everything happens on this side of eternity. We focus so much on this life, but there's more to the story. We get, our, we get to our second scripture and it talks about this. And I just want to point out, I don't think that that PowerPoint was incorrect. I think when I got to my scripture on Monday, I looked up the wrong one. And I don't know if that's on purpose or if God had a plan for that. Because these are not fun words to read. And when, I, when I read it, I said, really? Okay. It talks about the bad stuff of life, the bad things that are coming at the end of the world. We get to verse 10 and it says, Nation's going to go to war against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There's going to be great earthquakes and famine and plagues in the land, many terrifying and miraculous things from heaven. That's, that's not one we read very often around here. 
It continues, it says, but before this occurs, there's going to be a time of great persecution. You will be dragged into the synagogues and the prisons. You're going to stand trial before kings and governors because you are my followers. A little bit later it says, even the closest to you, your parents, brothers, relatives, friends, they will betray you. Some, they will even kill some of you. And everyone will hate you because you're my followers. Why would I find that verse instead of the one I was supposed to read? Why couldn't I just read a nice little story about some guys, what is it, the evil farmers? No, I found this other verse instead. I don't know why, but then we're going to go with it. We're going to keep going. It's not a happy picture. The path to paradise might be really rough. It does, there's no promise. <laughs>
Stand firm in God, and you will save your soul. You will win your soul. God comes first, and everything else is commentary. God is our foundation, and then you can pile everything else on top of that. Love God, love your neighbor. This is how we plan for eternity. This is how we store up our treasure in heaven. How to survive the end of the world. The truth is, it all comes down to priorities. What's the most important thing in your life? Is it God? Is it sports? Football, volleyball, basketball, baseball? Is it work, the mine, the hospital, the bank, traveling? Is it your family? Is it nature, hiking, hunting, biking? You live in a beautiful place. A lot of toys, a lot of moments. What's the most important thing in your life? And again, I'm not saying these things are bad. The key to surviving the end of the world is to put God first and then turn to everything else. God is eternal. And so I leave you with this. May you measure your life by your connection to God. May you measure your life by your connection to God. May you plan for eternity loving God and loving your neighbor. Because we are second to one. And he is second to none.